first episode of this five-part series, we looked at the increased wildfire activity in recent history, both in behavior and scale, and the unprecedented funding announced to support work across the country. Confronting the Wildfire Crisis, a strategy for protecting communities and improving resilience in America's forests, is designed to provide a number of benefits for communities, the environment, and wildlife. Throughout the rest of this series, we'll talk with experts, residents, and scientists about each of these topics. In this episode, we'll take a look at how we got here, how past practices, coupled with drought and a changing climate, have resulted in unhealthy forest stands more susceptible to invasive species and drought. It's a dangerous mix of factors that are increasing the risk of catastrophic wildfire in these areas. Long before European colonists stepped foot on North America and before settlers stretched out across the continent, vast networks of indigenous peoples tended the land. They knew then what would take scientists hundreds of more years to agree on, that fire was a part of the landscape, inseparable, and that to try to exclude it from the landscape would create great imbalance. What my people have done for, for millions of years is tend the land with fire because the tribe didn't have hand tools as we have now, chainsaws and, and whatnot. So it was all done by fire. Um, and from protecting the village to the ridge tops, our hunting, our hunting grounds, our uh, basket weaving materials. Well, they're starting to get some data now to back that up to where it's, it's giving the cultural practitioner a leg to stand on because the science is real. They're going to believe what the native folks have been saying because there's now some empirical knowledge and uh, evidence that supports what the, the native folks have been saying. That is that it is real. If you put fire on the ground the right time of year, you will have multiple gain, resource, uh, wildlife. Tending the land with fire helped the, helped the ecosystem. They made it balanced. And so to me, that's what fire is. It's bringing balance back to the ecosystem that is fire starved. Though the use of prescribed fire and cultural burning were outlawed in the early 20th century, early thought leaders suspected that there was more to know. People like the U.S. Forest Service's founder, Gifford Pinchot. In 1899, he published an article in National Geographic, The Relation of Forest and Forest Fires, describing the role of fire in the forest, observing that to claim wildfire as entirely bad was missing a big part of the picture. We have not stated everything when we say that a given forest is destroyed by fire. The forests which the first white explorers saw as they landed on this continent and gradually overran it were themselves the successors of others, which through thousands of years were burned down at intervals that we can no longer trace. Gifford Pinchot But following an infamous wildfire in 1910 that burned more than 3 million acres and killed 87 people, there was a call to remove fire from the landscape completely. Early in my career, we were extinguishing most all of the fires at the smallest possible footprint. And, we, and the agency has a long history of doing that, thinking we were doing the right thing. Basically waging a war on wildfire. Over the years, and what we've recognized most recently is the fact that fire plays an important role in the landscape. The result of those decisions created conditions for ever denser forest, with more trees per acre, resulting in dangerous levels of fuel loading, that if a fire were to spark, it would be increasingly hard to contain. But that's only part of the picture. At its foundation, high fire intensity is related to forest health, which is also related to overstocked forest conditions. Uh, many of our ecosystems around here burn anywhere from 3 to 15 years depending on uh, the vegetation type. We often utilize prescribed fire in the shoulder seasons, to reduce the amount of vegetation and remove that fuel prior to a uh, wildfire coming. We can put fire back on the landscape to mimic how fire used to occur here and try to prevent those wildfires that can devastate our communities and our watersheds. Based on uh, fire exclusion or other reasons, forests will become more dense than what is uh, optimal health for them. And so in a more dense forest, the trees are all competing for the same resources 
And so a lot of our work is aimed at trying to thin them to a lower density to where they're not competing for uh, nutrients, sunlight, and water. So when it's more dense, the individual tree vigor is less. And so those different factors like drought and climate change, pathogens and insects, a tree is um, not gonna do as good of a job protecting itself against those types of things. And so it's a win-win. We reduce the densities for the trees, they're healthier, and then also reduce fire hazard. Trees are competing. There's always a limited amount of resources. So uh, nutrients like uh, nitrogen and carbon, and then water, and then uh, sunlight. And so as they grow closer together, there's uh, less light. A lot of the sh trees are more shaded. Across the U.S., overstocked forests are resulting in these same unhealthy conditions. In the Klamath Basin, national forests are working with partners to return areas to historical stand densities, the type that existed before fire exclusion policies and had long before been implemented by indigenous peoples. Unfortunately, many of these stands are so thick that it is not safe to reintroduce fire in its natural role. These areas require a certain type of treatment first, mechanical thinning. Mount Shasta City in California is um, approximately 3,500 people. There's tens of thousands in the general vicinity, but well, the whole point of this was to, um, re this particular project was to reduce fuels in the wildland urban interface because we're adjacent to the city of Mount Shasta and to thin out these plantations so that our desired condition essentially is to have fuels reduced and um, large pine, you know, pine stands throughout the landscape here rather than brush fields and overdense stands that are really uh, heavy to the fuel loading. Some criticize these practices. They say the denser the forest, the better, but that often means that when there is a fire, it may burn so hot that there is nothing left. So you'll start to see tree mortality with increased tree density. You'll see a lot more extreme fire behavior in stands with increased density, just because uh, you can see that the, the fuels reach all the way to the ground. They are interlocking, so it's super easy for fire to move from one tree to another and spread pretty quickly um, up and down trees and then um, onto the next one. So you'll see increased fire behavior in areas like this. I would say thinning the forest is the right thing to do for the forest. It helps with uh, tree health. And then on a bigger picture, the, the forest is poised better for whatever type of disturbance that it's gonna encounter, whether that be pathogens, um, insects, or fire. The, the stand after it's been thinned is better set to um, be more resilient and resistant to those things. These forests that have been mechanically thin can also be used as fuel breaks and buffers between residents and an oncoming fire, a place where firefighters might be able to take a stand and contain a spreading fire. Our next episode will take a closer look at just how treatments can be used to protect communities and how the strategy to confront the wildfire crisis is addressing community safety in the Klamath Basin.